I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. Let's talk about one of the most badass health products in the world and one that I use quite literally every day, especially when I travel. So Organifi is how I upgrade my nutrition when I'm on the road. Now, every single person should have a green superfood supplement in their life because if you're anything like me, you got to be honest with yourself. Like, are you actually eating enough vegetables, enough greens? Probably not as much as we might need. So, you know, who has time to like run to the farmer's market and get fresh organic vegetables and greens and juice them and all that stuff? I mean, it's lovely if you, you know, you can roll like that, but let's face it, it's hard to do that at home, let alone when you travel. So that's why I love Organifi. They've got a green juice powder that is legit delicious. It's super easy to mix up. It's not all clumpy and goofy. You know, some powders you try to throw in a, you know, in a glass and stir them with a spoon and it won't work. That totally sucks when that happens. It's super annoying. So I love Organifi and you can find everything they do over at Organifi.com forward slash Luke. If you use the code Lifestylist, you're going to save 20% off your order. That's Organifi with an I, Organifi.com forward slash Luke. Good place to start is the green powder, man. Organifi green is legit, delicious, super good for you, super energizing, and very easy to travel with if you get the little travel pack. So Organifi.com forward slash Luke is where you want to go. Welcome to a very special episode of the Lifestylist podcast. This is our community Q&A episode. It's a solo show where I answer questions from the Lifestylist podcast Facebook group. If you'd like to have some of your questions answered on a future episode, please join the group and ask away. There's plenty of great people in there that can answer questions just like I can. So please join the party. I'd like to let you know that I am not a doctor. I am not a trained professional. This is not medical advice. The answers I'm going to give you are just my opinion based on my personal research and experience. Make sure you always consult with a professional before embarking on wacky self-experimentation and biohacks, okay? It's also likely that I'm mistaken on certain facts as I'm just learning as I go, like you. I'm always open-minded and I easily discard my beliefs as I find better information and I definitely encourage you to do the same. So follow your heart, follow your gut and your intuition to find out what's right for you. The answers I'm about to provide in this episode have been gleaned from my 22 plus years of work on my own healing journey and I'm learning more all the time. Very pleased to present this episode to you. It's been a long time coming. I've been getting requests for Q&A, Ask Me Anything style bonus shows for a long time. And for some reason, I've just had a real mental block around it. And I finally sat down. I went through the Facebook group, a couple months worth of questions, and I just hit record. And so you get a completely unedited, raw and real approach to this Q&A. So enjoy. And again, if you'd like to have some of your questions answered, please jump into the Lifestylist Podcast Facebook group and we'll do our best to help you out and support you. Enjoy the show. Our first question comes from Leela who asks, what are the top easiest and budget-friendly hacks apart from water and meditation? Oh, Leela, I hesitate to even answer this question because I know you're not going to do any of this stuff. Well, no, I don't know that. But nobody wants to do the budget-friendly stuff because those, my friends, are the ones that require discipline. Those are the ones that you can't take a pill, powder, or machine for. Those are the ones that require some gumption on your part. So I'll go ahead and give you what my top free or budget-friendly biohacks are Absolutely, because I think they are the most powerful. The number one is aligning yourself with nature. And this means getting outside as much as humanly possible. Now, I'm working inside now, and I was working inside for much of the day, but luckily where I live now, I have a backyard. So I took tons of sun breaks. I went outside off and on intermittently all the time. So if there was anything that I could do outside, I went outside, took the dog for a walk, 
uh, took an ice bath, lifted some weights, did my thing. Actually, no, I didn't lift weights. I did the X3 bar, but that's like the equivalent of lifting weights, maybe even better. Uh, actually, I'm quite certain it's better. More effective, faster, safer, but that's a whole other <laughs> it's a whole other podcast. Actually, I did a podcast on the X3 bar. Point is getting outdoors. And we're all like, cool, I'll do that. I'll go for a walk. I'll get outdoors. But I'm going to tell you about the ones that are a little bit more challenging now. And the number one thing you can do for your health, and I truly believe this is true. I learned, I mean, I've been doing this for years off and on. It's called sun gazing. But the part that I really got and mostly got this on a really deeply scientific level was from Dr. Jack Cruz, who's been on the show a number of times. And I asked him uh, during our last session, what is the number one thing I can do, Jack, to really have tons of energy, to feel vital, and to just kick ass in my life? And he said, if you could only do one thing, Luke, here's what you do. You wake up right before dawn and you get outdoors and you watch the sunrise. And I started doing that. It's called sun gazing. I've been sun gazing for years. It's an ancient Ayurvedic practice. Watch the sunset, watch the sunrise. Um, please, by the way, if you do this, make sure that you research how to safely sun gaze. I'm not talking about going out at noon and staring at the sun uh, like a mental patient and frying your eyeballs out. I do not want to be responsible for that. But there is an ancient practice throughout all of human history known as sun gazing. It's had different names, but it just has to do with looking near the sun or at the sun at certain times of the day and at sunrise and sunset are the safest times of day because there's very low, if any, UV light, which is what would harm your eyes. There's tons of nourishing red light. So Jack told me this. I started doing it when I was in my last apartment because I had a clear line of sight to the sunset on the horizon. Uh, and I swear to God, I did that for about four or five days. And at that time of year, this would have been a few months ago, uh, the sunrise, it would think it was like at 6.30. So it wasn't that bad. Now I think it's 5.30 or 6 or something. It's, it's pretty rough. And I moved into a house that's in a canyon. So I'd have to go in the dark and get in my car and drive up the hill. I mean, it's probably literally a two or three minute drive, but I haven't done it yet. I don't know. I just can't do it. So oftentimes, you guys, I'm going to tell you, like, do the stuff that I'm not doing, but it's the stuff that works. Anyway, I'm in this apartment. I did my sun gazing, uh, you know, uh, maybe 20 minutes, and I do my breath. I do get my breath work in too while I'm watching the sun rise. I'd sit there with my dog Cookie, and I have a little oxytocin from good Cookie puppy vibes. Do my breath work and watch that sunrise, and the amount of energy I had was insane. The levels of dopamine, the the good mood that was possible was insane. My ability to cope with stress. What was really interesting about it is that it so quickly regulated my circadian rhythm so that after four or five days, I'm not even kidding, I just started waking up at that time full of energy every single day, no matter how late I stayed up, which was a little bit of a challenge because oftentimes I stay up till 11 30, 12, 12 30, even sometimes one or 1 30. It's not a habit that I like to maintain, but unfortunately, that's just how I roll. In a perfect world, I would be asleep by 11 every night. I've been trying to do that for about 48 years. Uh, it's a slow process. Anyway, man, sun gazing at dawn is the number one hack, but who is going to get up that early? Uh, you'd have to be nuts, right? Maybe you're a morning person. The next one is to eliminate all, and I mean all, 100% of the time, blue light at night. See, I told you you weren't going to like it. Wah, wah. You just want to go take a vitamin, a supplement, a smart drug. You want all the biohacking tech. Well, you said you want budget-friendly ones. Listen, you can get a cheap pair of blue blockers that actually work, I think, probably for, I don't know, a few bucks maybe like a cheap ass pair for 50 bucks or something I want to say. Uh, I'm wearing some right now by Blue Blocks, one of our sponsors. I've got some from uh, Raw Optics, one of our other sponsors. I'm, you know, I'm a huge fan of all the different uh, blue blocking eyewear as long as it's the, the right spectrum that blocks the blue light that you want to block. And then I've just uh, uh, changed all the bulbs in my house to incandescent bulbs, or at least, you know, there's a set of nighttime bulbs and then there's some daytime bulbs. So the lights that are on in my studio right now are, you know, full spectrum incandescent bulbs. That means they have a lot of blue light. And so I have my glasses on right now. But normally in my office, I would have a program on my computer called Iris. Uh, I think their site is iris.co, something like that. Just look up Iris blue blocking and you'll find it. 
I think actually it's on my site too. If you look under biohacking or sleep on lukestory.com forward slash store, you'll find Iris. I think it's like 10 bucks. It'll change your life. So I did a little bit of work and I had to habituate myself to block all blue light. But I find, I mean, I have close friends and people that I'm around all the time and they're like, okay, what's the best supplement? Like I have no energy or I'm having this problem or that problem. And I'm like, dude, you got to get rid of the blue light at night. You can't make melatonin. That's It's the master hormone. It's the most potent um, anti-cancer compound that the human body produces. Like melatonin does so much more than just making you sleep. And I've done podcast after podcast on it. Uh, people do not want to have the discipline to block blue light because it is inconvenient. It sucks. I don't want to be having to wear some glasses right now. I just want to do my podcast. You know what I mean? But again, uh, super cheap, and that will absolutely change your life. And uh, next one is breath work. And I think the most accessible breath work is really probably just downloading the Wim Hof app. It's called Inner Fire, and he leads you through these lessons. I forget if it costs money. If it does, it's a couple bucks. Definitely worth it. Uh, breath work, again, is something I recommend to a lot of people. And they're like, oh, yeah, cool, I'll do it. And then I see him again. I go, hey, you've been doing your breath work? No, I'm not doing it. Why? Because uh, it's work. It's called breath work. <laughs> it's called breath work for a reason. Even myself, I mean, I want to do it every day. And I just, I'll think about, oh, I'm going to go outside and do some breath work. And I'm like, ah, it's hard to get it going. You know, I usually do maybe 12 to 21 minutes or so. And I find that it's really hard to get the breath work started. You know, it's kind of like you go to the gym. You're like, oh God, I don't want to drive to the gym. Once you're there, you throw on a couple of weights, you jump on a couple of machines, whatever you're in. And then you're like, cool, I got this. And then you get a good workout in whatever your equivalent of that is. Say you go running or go hike up a hill, you know, the first hundred yards of a hike sucks ass. And then you kind of get your stride and you get your groove on and it's no probs, right? Well, same would be true of breath work. Really hard to get started, but totally worth it once you do. If you want to have energy, uh, watching the sunrise and doing some breath work will rock your life to the point where you probably won't need any supplements, especially if you take that uh, other recommendation of blocking all blue light at night. And all blue light, just to clarify for those of you that don't understand what I'm talking about, is any light that enters your eye after the sun goes down that is not amber or red. That's blue light. So any light that's white is blue light. I'll do a podcast on them. You know, I've done podcasts where all the experts say, hey, you got to avoid blue light. It's all a thing. But I really want to do one with someone who's a major expert just on that particular thing. Maybe I'll, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make a promise to myself right now. I'm going to get Matt Maruka on and we're just going to talk about blue light for like three goddamn hours so I can really hammer this home. Then when people are like, I don't get it, why? I can go, hey, jump to episode number blah, 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 and learn all about blue light. So Maddie, if you hear this, get ready, buddy. We're going to rock it. All right, next one is getting sunshine, getting sun on your body, especially on your naked body, your whole body. That means genitalia and all, as often as you can without burning. So my recommendation would be to get yourself, get your buns, get that booty outdoors in the sun. Now, it's difficult to do sometimes if you live in, live in the uh, Northern Hemisphere, if you live in Lapland, Finland or something, you're not getting much sun. But uh, personally, I would move. <laughs> like, I won't live anywhere, um, you know, unless I'm forced to because of passport issues or something. But I won't live anywhere where there's not lots of sun. You know, I've been talking to my girlfriend about where we might want to live in the future and one of my non-negotiables is there has to be trees, bodies of water, and sun. I'm not going to go live somewhere. I'm not living in like Portland or something where it's all foggy. I can't do it. I got to have sun. So get your naked body in the sun. There's a number of reasons why. That will change your life. The energy that it gives you is just insane. However, do it safely and make sure that you don't burn. There's a number of different things you can do to make sure you don't burn. One thing you can do is build up your solar callus. And doing red light therapy, blocking blue light at night, believe it or not, makes you more resilient. Sun gazing at dusk and dawn helps build your solar callus because you're getting your eye exposed to that red light. It's really crazy uh, the way our body responds to light. And the temperature of light that you get at different times of day does different things to you and for you. So if you only have a few minutes to get out into the sun, I would recommend doing it at solar noon where whatever that happens to be at your location, because that's when the sun is most powerful. 
the next one that is budget friendly, and this would be our last one, I think, would be Kundalini Yoga. This practice has absolutely changed my life. Uh, there is so much to the practice, the uh, singing of mantra, the different movements, the Kriya, the actual Kundalini exercise. And then also, of course, just the insane number of different mudras and breath work that's available within the kundalini yoga practice. I've been practicing and now teaching for a total of, I don't know, eight years or so. I've interviewed some of the most renowned teachers and leaders in the kundalini yoga community, of course, on this show, like Guru Jagat and my teacher Tej and Guru Singh, for example. And out of the hundreds and hundreds of classes I've taken and all the teacher training and everything, uh, I've never been to a Kundalini class that was the same as any other. There's just, there's literally thousands of different orders and sequences of movements and breath and song, and also just the sense of community, you know, getting in a room full of people who have the same intention. And that intention, of course, would be. A spiritual ascension and removing blocks to experiencing God. You know, it's a very spiritual practice. Uh, in my experience, though, it's very inclusive. And um, you don't have to wear white. You don't have to wear a turban. You know, if you're at all familiar with Kundalini Yoga, you you might associate some of the accoutrement with it. But I would discourage you from being dissuaded I would dissuade you from being dissuaded by any of the, you know, the sort of um, theatrics of it, <laughs> you could say. I mean, I, I walk in Kundalini yoga. I just wear whatever I'm wearing that day, which is usually all black. You know, I look like I'm, I don't know, like a goth or something in, in my yoga class. And I don't care. No one else cares. They're just doing their thing. I'm just doing my thing. So it's a very, at least in LA, you know, and I've done some classes in New York also. Very inclusive, accepting community. It's just people that want to have a more spiritual way of life. And when you use these ancient practices and these energies to remove the blocks that are preventing you from experiencing your higher self and experiencing a reality in its glorious divinity, uh, it's just absolutely incredible, you know, because happiness, peace, joy, abundance, all of these things are always a moment away. They're always available but what happens is um, our karma, our trauma, all the things that we go through in life sort of build up within us and uh, essentially um, extinguish the inner fire. You know, and Kundalini Yoga uses the energy and these practices to activate that fire within you again. I mean, there's, you know, one of the main staples of Kundalini Yoga is breath of fire. I do this every day, just all day throughout my day. <laughs> <laughs> breath of fire. You're always going to find me doing it. I stand on my vibe plate, stand in front of the juve. I do it in the sun. I do it all the time. You know, I do it. Some Don't do this, but sometimes I do it in my ice bath. You're not supposed to do breath work in an ice bath. Just disclaimer there, but I've been doing both for long enough uh, that, um, you know, I, f I feel quite safe. I don't do anything too extreme because some breath work and a lot of the stuff in Kundalini Yoga can make you straight pass the F out. So, a word to the wise there. I'm just trying to indicate that um, the Kundalini Yoga practice has been hugely transformative and healing for me. And uh, it's one that doesn't cost a lot of money. I think I'm on a monthly at Nine Treasures Yoga. It's $119 or something, which, you know, if I went every day, I'd really be getting a good deal. I don't go as often as I would like to, but uh, I'm happy to make my contribution to that organization. And I said that was the last one, but I'm just going to add one more budget friendly hack in. And that would be something called cold thermogenesis. And that means getting your behind in some cold ass water, whether that be a lake, river, ocean, ice bath, even cryotherapy. It's not that budget friendly. So it might not fit within the criteria of Leela's question. But hot and cold extremes are really, really good for you. And if you think about it, humans have evolved to be exposed to the elements all the time. And it's only been maybe the past couple hundred years that we've been able to live in structures that are completely regulated in terms of temperature all the time, which is completely unnatural and really, really unhealthy. We're sort of like zoo animals living in these houses and working in these office buildings. And you know the way in which we live is just completely in direct opposition to nature. And a big part of that is 
our sheer terror at the idea of being cold for three minutes. I mean, I try to get people to do cold showers and they just freak out. I'm like, dude, you live in Hawaii. The water's like 65 degrees. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I'm going to admit cold showers, you know, like in New York City in the winter, I go there sometimes in the winter and I'm like, okay, this is a real cold shower or in, uh, in Colorado, you know, in the winter, real cold, but still nothing better, man. Nothing better than an ice bath, a cold shower, uh, you know, basically free and will change your life. So if you never took a supplement, you never bought any of the crazy biohacking gadgets and none of that stuff, and you just did the things I recommended right there a few times a week and started building those into your life, I guarantee you in one year, you would be a completely different person, straight up. We'll be right back at you after this brief but important announcement. Would you like me to save you some serious cash right now? Listen up. You're probably wasting tons of money on vitamins, herbs, supplements, maybe even prescription drugs, trying to improve your sleep, your sense of well-being, happiness, your energy levels. And I'm here to tell you, all you really need to do is probably just get solid REM and deep sleep. Not enough hours per se, but enough of the right types of sleep. And I can also tell you based on my research and interviews with over 200 experts on this here podcast over the past few years, that if you are not blocking blue light from your life at night, you are not producing enough melatonin to give you the type of sleep that you really need. Enter the company, one of my favorite sponsors, Blue Blocks. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X, blueblocks.com. Make some not only attractive and pretty cool looking glasses of the prescription, non-prescription, and even reading glass nature, but you can also get 15% off on their website by entering the code LIFESTYLIST. So their glasses look cool, but they really work to cut out the blue and green spectrum of light that trashes your melatonin, hormones, and neurotransmitters. So if you want to be healthy, listen, stop ordering a couple of those supplements and just work on your lighting. This is really, really important. And I'm very enthusiastic about this because after changing all the lighting in my house to old style incandescent bulbs and wearing protective uh, glasses like this at night when I go out or watch TV or work on a computer, whatever the case may be, um, my health has improved dramatically and so has my energy and my mood. It's serious stuff and it's very affordable and much cheaper than some of the other interventions that you're probably trying right now or some of the medical interventions that are likely to be necessary later on. So go to blueblocks.com, enter the code LIFESTYLIST to save 15%. And now back to the interview. Next up, Jennifer asks, looking for a kick-ass whole house water system. How does this compare to reverse osmosis structured water with remineralization? And she gives a reference to something called life source water systems. I looked at the site briefly and wasn't terribly impressed. So what I'm going to just say about the water piece is, uh, you know, I'm in a rental house right now. And so I get I'm so fortunate and believe me, I identify the many ways in which I'm fortunate and I do not feel guilty because I've been working my ass off since 1986 to be in the position that I'm in and I'm working even harder to get where I want to go. But uh, my lovely friends over at Live Spring Water uh, every two weeks just auto deliver the most pristine, clean, untouched by anyone spring water into my kitchen in 2.5 glass bottles. And it's some of the best water I've ever tasted in my life. If there was like a, a water tasting competition, I think they would win. So uh, I drink that water and then I don't do anything else to filter water that I wash my hands with or water the plants with or anything like that, unfortunately. But I do have kind of a cheesy little bath ball that you know, when you fill up the tub, I have like a hot tub kind of or jacuzzi tub in this house. And when I fill that up, I rigged, you know, I kind of have to like roll up a towel and then make the spigot go through this little charcoal kind of filter so that I at least somewhat filter my bath water. I'm not real excited about this method, but it's better than nothing. Another thing I'll do is I'll put a couple drops of nascent iodine, which is sort of on the periodic table, as I understand it at least. Uh, again, I'm not a scientist here, but uh, it's on the opposite side of the spectrum of the halogens like uh, chloramine and chlorine. So 
it's my theory that I'm doing a little bit to sort of counteract uh, those toxins in the water by adding a little iodine. And I also use um, Epsom salts and magnesium chloride flakes and uh, baking soda and a lot of different things, essential oils that I add to my bath. So to me, the benefits of taking a bath in not really filtered LA city water still outweigh the detriments or the possible detriments of bathing in some somewhat toxic water. However, due to the fact that I don't own this home, I'm not in a big hurry to go spend three to $10,000 to filter all the water here when my lease only has six more months. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I also have two shower filters uh, that I definitely am committed to. One, I, <laughs> I connected two of them together just because if one's good, two must be better. One of them is from Pristine Hydro down in Laguna Beach. I have that on my website, lukestory.com forward slash store. Uh, as do I have the other filter I have, which is made by Omica. They're both really great filters. They both you know, claim to be the best. Uh, they're both very convincing, which is why I couldn't pick one. And I just connected two of them together. Looks kind of weird, but I'm getting double filtered shower water. And that's my water strategy. But back to Jennifer's question here on a kick-ass whole house water system in all of my research, and water has been something I've been obsessed with for years. I've just been in LA and I've been a renter. So I'm kind of just filtering at the source and drinking uh, spring waters I described. But I've yet to find a company that makes a whole house system that's going to make water that is that meets my standards for drinking. In other words, like she mentioned, the structured water and remineralize, remineralization, et cetera. Uh, this is where it gets really tricky, you know, because if you do distilled water, if you do RO water, you're taking out all things that make it water. And now you have some sort of pharmaceutical clear liquid that to me is just completely unnatural. So then people are trying to restructure it and add minerals back in. And none of the systems that I've seen, and they might exist and I just haven't found them yet, that do the whole house really give you an end result water that would equal a great spring water or something like that. Um, so what I personally would do in this situation is, um, and I'm going to do this when I buy a house, hopefully soon. If you guys, um, shop a lot at my store, maybe someday I'll get there. <laughs> just kidding. I don't make very much money in my store because I don't sell anything. I just link out to other people's stuff and get commissions here and there. But anyway, kind of joking, kind of not, but, uh, no, when I buy a house, uh, soon, hopefully, what I will do is I will get a unit that will filter out all of the water in the house so that the bathing water and, you know, if I'm, well, actually I, would, I wouldn't give my dog that water even. I give my dog the good spring water, but I'm trying to think of other, you know, watering plants and stuff like that, right? Taking a bath, filling up the jacuzzi, et cetera, the swimming pool, all that would be the whole house filter. And then if I couldn't get my spring water delivered or if I couldn't go out and collect it myself, using a site like findaspring.com, then what I would do is I would do a whole house filter and then locally at the source, I would use a filter system under the sink, like the kitchen sink, for example, for drinking water, cooking water, et cetera, that does in fact restructure the water and add minerals. And the best ones that I've found uh, are two different companies, Pristine Hydro, and I mentioned before, and then also a company out of Santa Barbara called Ophora. And both of those companies make just insanely amazing water filters that take municipal super toxic sludge water and turn it into what would be really close to a beautiful, healthy spring water. Now, if you want all of the information and all of my recommendations on water, I put together this insanely comprehensive free guide. It's my water guide. Here's how you get it. Go to lukestory.com forward slash 129. That's lukestory.com forward slash 129. If you're on a US phone, you can text the water guide, all one word, all lowercase, the water guide to the number 44222. So again, if you want my ultimate guide to water for free, go to lukestory.com forward slash 129 or text the water guide to 44222. Now, if you go to lukestory.com forward slash 129, that's going to link to this trilogy podcast series that I did all about water. It's about seven hours worth of content all about spring water, bottled water, which filters are the best, the ins and outs of all of it. 
it's probably the most comprehensive piece of content I've ever seen. And I've looked at a lot of it uh, on water. So you can find it all there. But there's, you know, my basic recommendations on Jennifer's question about the whole house filter versus, you know, filtering locally for your drinking water. Again, to summarize, I would do a whole house filter. Um, If you're on a well, though, I would have the water tested. I'll explain how to do that um, in another episode. I don't have the link in front of me. Um, I think it might be in my water. Yeah, it's in my water guide, actually, how you get your water tested. There's a company that does it that gives you a whole lab report. If my well water was decent, then I would just use that to bathe in and water the plants. Um, do the hot tub, the pool, et cetera. And then I would filter the water for drinking and cooking and feeding pets and things like that uh, right at the kitchen sink. Um, If I couldn't get access to really good spring water, which is surprisingly easy to do in most places in the world. Okay, let's do one more question and answer here. This one's from Lisa. She says... What's the top thing you've done to change your life besides getting sober? That's such a great question. I love talking about this stuff. You know, the health things and all that is, I don't know, to me, it's almost like, you know, you just take care of the body so that you can do the soul work. And the soul work is what Lisa, I think, is referring to. It's the spiritual growth. It's the mental health, the emotional health. It's, uh, to me, kind of all the other categories of sobriety, you know, being sober, most people think of as, oh, you don't drink or you don't do drugs. But to me, there are so many different levels of sobriety, right? There's financial sobriety, meaning that you're not in debt. Um, you don't you know, spend as a drug. And trust me, I've done both of those. I no longer do either of them, which feels really good. So I feel very financially sober. There is a sexual sobriety where you're uh, behaving with a, a sense of integrity and accountability and you're respecting yourself and you're respecting others. And you're perhaps not using sex in a way that's addictive or a way that's masking or medicating unresolved trauma. There's emotional sobriety where you have some, what's the word I'm looking for? Control is not a great word because (laughs) control would indicate, you know, that you perhaps lack surrender in your life. But emotional sobriety to me would be having balanced emotions, right? Where your emotions aren't too extreme in one direction or the other, where perhaps someday I get a little sad, I might have a little depression, I might have some mild anxiety. uh, But generally speaking, I don't tend to oscillate at extreme levels emotionally. So I'm always working on emotional sobriety. So when Lisa asked the question, you know, what's the top thing you've done to change your life besides getting sober? My answer would really be, and this is just off the top of the dome, I have a bunch of a list of things I'm going to go through here. But Uh, This just kind of came to me um, spontaneously. It's like further deepening my interpretation of sobriety. It's just, you know, having a sound mind and being balanced and not feeling crazy, thinking crazy, speaking crazy, acting crazy, really working to upgrade my character, to have more integrity, to be more kind to be more thoughtful, to be more honest with myself, to strive for more humility in my life, to strive to practice and apply spiritual principles in a more dedicated, consistent way in my life, to become more aware of how my ego can interfere in my higher self or my true self's desire to evolve and to uh, live an abundant, prosperous, peaceful, loving life of contribution and service, you know, really looking at the things that block me from being the best person that I can be. So to me, that's all sort of included in sobriety and the physical sobriety of, you know, in my particular case of not, uh, you know, choosing not to take recreational drugs and alcohol. And the reason I kind of give the caveat there is I, you know, I have taken plant medicines and things like that since I've been sober um, quite recently for the first time, really, as some of you may have heard in the Uh, Welcome to the Jungle Ayahuasca Experience podcast trilogy that I did uh, not too long ago. But I, you know, I'm not doing coke and you know, going out drinking beers. I'm not smoking weed. I'm 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 a sober guy, you know. So, you know, that's the first level. That's jacks for openers. That's like cool. Let me not use drugs and alcohol as an escape. And hey, no judgment if that's still your escape. It was mine for a long, long time. It was very effective. I'm very grateful that that escape was available to me when it was. But at a certain point, that became the side effects, 
And the negative consequences of that coping mechanism just began to outweigh the benefits. It's just that simple. It's simple math. It's a law of diminishing returns. And for me, that hit around 26 years old, which was 22 plus years ago. So deepening my view and experience of sobriety, Lisa, is the top thing that I've done. Here are some of the ways that I've done that. Let's get into that. So uh, before I mentioned Kundalini Yoga, so I don't need to explain that, but man, that is just a, just such a powerful transformative practice. And one of the things I, I don't think I really talked about as a benefit to the Kundalini Yoga practice earlier is just the immense heart opening that comes with that practice. Like if you're truly a dedicated Kundalini practitioner, your heart is going to heal and your heart's going to open. It takes some time, but there's been many a class, many a workshop where I'm seeing Pat. I mean, it's almost like it's very, it's, it's similar in a sense to my experience with ayahuasca. It's just a lot slower and a bit more gentle, but experiences where I'm kind of reliving past traumas. I'm I'm grieving losses. Uh, I'm grieving attachments, profound sadness, just laying there in Kundalini yoga class after like a really intense Kriya and just crying, just bawling. With equal measure, um, I've had situations in that practice where I just sit there and laugh my ass off and I'm experiencing the most profound bliss, you know? And I, I think that's all due to the fact that so many energies get stuck within our body and especially within the heart chakra. And that practice just has the ability to move those energies around in such a powerful way. So that's been a huge cornerstone to my evolution, my peace, my happiness, my mental health, emotional health. Uh, That's been something that's really helped me not only maintain sobriety, but really deepen my experience of it. Next would be letting go of resentments. Oh my God, man. I used to just hate people so much, you guys. It's, it might be hard for you to imagine because when I do these podcasts and do the things that I do on social media, I probably seem like a pretty happy guy. You know why? Because I really love what I do. And so sure, there's times I get pissed off and people piss me off and I get annoyed in traffic and I'm like a normal guy. But when I do these podcasts and do the things that I do, I'm doing what I love. So you're seeing me or hearing me at my most happy, best self. And of course, I'm on my best behavior because everyone's watching, right? Let's be honest. However, uh, I I am so grateful and humbled to say that for the most part, I really live free of resentments at this point in my life. And it it wasn't that way before, man. I mean, uh, I used to just I used to just uh, stew over situations and people uh, in which I felt I had been slighted or harmed. And I mean, I was just obsessed with thoughts of revenge and condemnation, and I was just toxic and poisoned with hatred for so long, for so many years of my life. And so uh, working through different systems, which I'll describe in a moment, uh, different teachings and practices, I've really, really made a lot of progress in releasing those resentments and just releasing anger in general and also forgiving others, you know, um, not just others from the past, uh, people that have victimized me or harmed me, uh, in, you know, in childhood and in adolescence and earlier in life, but also just on an ongoing basis. You know, just yesterday I pulled into the Beverly Hot Springs, which is just like the spot that I go escape to and just chill. It's like, it's a natural hot springs in Koreatown, right in the middle of the city, which I, I shouldn't even be talking about on my podcast because everyone's going to go there and ruin it for me. No, it's a great, I love turning people on to stuff like that. I mean, you would never know right in the middle of Koreatown on Western and Beverly, like just busy ass, polluted, nasty ass part of town. In my opinion, no offense if you happen to live on that corner, uh, but not where you'd expect to find like an amazing, beautiful, natural hot springs inside a Korean spa. Um, so anyway, yesterday pull in there uh, with my girlfriend. We we're just taking a drive. And I was like, hey, I want to stop by here and ask them if their outdoor pool is open yet. And she was like, oh, I'm hungry. Like, what? I thought we we're going to go eat. And I'm like, okay, okay, just a minute, just a minute. I'm like super annoying and spontaneous like that. And so I just pull in there and I was going to go inside and ask them. And then I saw the security guard outside and um, he was an older Asian man. And so I was like, oh, hey, man, uh, is the outdoor pool ready? And he didn't understand what I was saying. You know, he had a limited grasp uh, on the English language, or at least my version of it. And I kept trying to explain it to him. And the next thing you know, he's like getting super pissed at us, like telling us to get out of the parking lot. And I'm like, dude, no, 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 no. Like I come here all the time, you know, and he's just not getting me. He's getting, he's getting aggravated. And um, I said something kind of, I don't remember what it was, but something pretty 
aggressive, uh, you know, I don't like scream at him or anything, but I was, I was kind of a dick back and, um, you know, pulled it out of the parking lot and that was it. I'm not proud of the fact that I, I wasn't able to take the higher road. I think I was like, yeah, whatever, we're leaving anyway. It's something like that. It wasn't even a big deal. I just, I wasn't like, you know, the Dalai Lama in that moment. And then we pulled out of the parking lot and I, I found myself having to take a couple breaths because that guy pissed me off. You know, he, he riled up my ego. I'm like, dude, I'm a, I've been a customer of this place for at least 10 years. Like I have a year pass, you know, I buy like a year long pass. It's like 600 bucks. That's how often I go there. It's cheaper, by the way, if you do that, it's only 20 bucks an entry instead of like 35 or 40 a little insider tip for you. Point being, I pull out of the parking lot and I saw my mind, and this is the beauty of the situation. I actually saw my mind start to go, who does he think he is? That's not my problem. You don't understand the language. Da, 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 da. I started having all these angry thoughts about him. And I just went, no, 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 nope, not having it. God bless that guy, man. He, he just misunderstood. Poor guy. He innocently, he, he, he thought we were trying to, you know, like just drive through their parking lot and, and just use it as a shortcut or something, I think was what he was, you know, um, understanding about what was happening, which was not the case. I, I was happy to see him, happy to go to the place. But I had to really just take a moment and go, you know, no, God bless that guy. I'm not going to ruin my night just because that guy had a misunderstanding and maybe his wife might have just left him or his kid might have just gotten hit by a car or, you know, maybe he can't pay his bills or who knows, you know, what's going on with him. It wasn't about me. And so a situation like that, I swear to God, this might sound crazy, but someone might have kind of come at me like that. And I could be thinking about it a week later. I'm not even kidding. Like, that I, like it's that was yesterday, which was Saturday, uh, late afternoon. Now it's uh, Sunday evening, about ten thirty p.m. The old me would have been like trying to go to sleep tonight, and I would still be thinking about that guy and like what I was going to do to him. I'm going to go back there, talk to the manager. I'm going to go back there and talk to him. You know, like just crazy thoughts. And um, one benefit of all of the practices that I've been doing, all the inner work, is that when situations like that happen, which are actually exceedingly rare, I'm able to really move through them most of the time very quickly. And I owe all of that, (laughs) this might sound crazy, but I owe that to the grace of God. You know, I just don't want to suffer. I don't want to suffer at the hand of my mind wanting to make someone else wrong and make myself right. It's a, it's a losing game. It's a fool's errand to be right. I would rather have peace then be right. And so through the act of surrender over all of these years, I find myself moving through those situations very quickly. And that's the forgiveness of others' transgressions and mistakes. And uh, also beyond that is the forgiving of myself, which I think has been even harder. You know, when I make mistakes, uh, like I kind of did yesterday and being a bit curt with that gentleman to not then beat myself up. You know, that's the, that's the, the master kind of game of the ego is to cause you to act out and act inappropriately. And then your mind will come back and kick your ass for, for you doing what it told you to do. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if that makes sense, but it's, it's kind of a double jeopardy or let's say, you know, you're you're wanting to mask some emotion. So you buy a pint of ice cream or a pack of cigarettes when you're trying to quit or you watch pornography or you do whatever. I'm just saying all the things I've done to cope. And then after it's the thing's done, it's like, I'm like, oh my God, I'm such a loser. I can't believe I did that. It's double jeopardy. And so it's the forgiveness of myself when I backslide or I make mistakes or I'm repeating old patterns, you know, is to be able to really say, Luke, you're all right, man. You're doing a good job to speak to that that little Luke, that inner child and say, dude, you're worth it. You made a mistake. It's okay. You don't have to be ashamed, you know, because guilt is is about something that you've done, right? It's feeling guilty. Oh, I did, you know, I, I, I wronged someone. I hurt someone. But guilt is really fast to overcome because you're not doing that thing anymore. It's the shame that comes along with it. You know, the shame is really about who you are, not what you've done. Guilt is about an instance a behavior, a situation. Shame is about the context of like who you think you are and all of that self-loathing and low self-worth and low self-esteem. So letting go of resentments and the forgiveness of others and perhaps even more importantly, the um, forgiveness and loving acceptance of myself. 
Next would be studying spiritual literature and not just studying it, but really applying it. You know, not just reading a spiritual book so I can put on Instagram, you know, oh, I read the spiritual book. I'm so spiritual. Nothing wrong with that, you know, for those of you that are posting your spiritual books on Instagram, but the spiritual bypass and the posturing doesn't do a lot to change one's character. So for me, I spent years, and it's funny because I don't really do a lot of this type of reading anymore. It's just I'm in a different place. I think I might be kind of ADD from having a cell phone for so long. <laughs> but I sit down and read the way that I used to read, and it almost it doesn't really come to me. I, maybe I'm just in a different place. I meditate more. I do the breath work. I do different stuff. But for many years, I did contemplative reading where I would take a spiritual text, and I'll give you some examples in a moment, And I would read one sentence or one paragraph over and over and over again and really, really take it and digest it. I think this is the idea behind uh, like a Bible study group, you know, where people go over uh, verses in the Bible or another spiritual text in in a group and really dissect the deeper and and multi-meaning of the words, you know, really looking at scripture and studying it. And I've done so much of that. But not just studying it so that I understand it, so that I can play the ego game of telling other people about it and showing everyone how much I know about it, but really internalizing it and applying it as I go live my life. So much like a meditation practice, it doesn't do you much good uh, if you don't take it off the mat, as we say, and go live it in life. You know, when that guy wants to kick you out of the parking lot, where's your meditation then? You know, <laughs> when someone steps on your foot at the bank or, you know, you, you walk up to a wait in line and there's like 20 teller stations in the bank or the DMV and there's only three tellers, you know, like do the math there. Where is all that spiritual literature and all that studying at that moment? In other words, how do I apply what I'm learning? And that's been a huge practice for me. Next would be going to therapy. Um, all types of different therapies since I'm 14 years old. I mean, that's how (laughs) whacked out I've been. I've needed a lot of help and I'm proud to say that I've found much of it. Um, Another thing I did was the Hoffman process. I did a podcast on that. I'm sorry, I don't have the show number in front of me, but uh, it was a pretty good episode with, um, you know, one of their big chiefs. That was um, a couple of years ago. I did that. It's a week long, really deep therapeutic process. I did something very similar called Onsite in Nashville, Texas. Um, I think I've been there two or three times. Similar kind of thing, like sort of like a sober retreat, you know, like a, um, like a rehab, but not to get you off drugs, just to make you less wacky. Uh, a healing group therapy sort of retreat kind of thing. So there's Hoffman Process and Onsite, both amazing. As I mentioned before, taking ayahuasca, Hugely transformative, very healing experience for me. I did three podcasts on that called Welcome to the Jungle. You can find them to learn more. Uh, Then going to Tony Robbins' Date with Destiny in Florida. While I found the bumping techno and the hours very challenging, uh, much more challenging than the the inner work, you know, and introspection and kind of um, self-inquiry that a lot of people seem to be having a hard time with. I was on board with that, but the music was rough for me. But despite that, I love Tony. Uh, I love his message. I love his heart. And being, you know, in a room with five, 6,000 people that are really committed to working on themselves is a powerful experience. And then um, uh, all sorts of different 12 step work, you know, working the 12 steps in whatever form one can find them or one that suits um, your particular kinks is very transformative and just applying those very basic spiritual principles to my life for so many years now has probably been really the number one foundational thing that has not only um, allowed me to achieve varying degrees of sobriety, but also just to maintain it. That was really the foundation of my whole life at 26 and um, have had so many deep and beautiful relationships formed out of that work. It's also something that's very difficult to talk about publicly because of the principle of anonymity. Um, Those of you that are involved in that teaching and have experienced that will know what I mean. It's I always get pissed when someone in the public kind of talks about that particular process, but um, I don't know. I I, I do my best to be tactful about it, but uh, I've got to I've got to you know give credit where credits due, and and that particular system of teaching has been. Uh, profoundly influential on my life. Then listening to thousands of hours, and I'm not even exaggerating, of audio programs, audiobooks, podcasts, 
by the greatest spiritual teachers that I think have been recorded, um, who would include people like Emmett Fox, Wayne Dyer, Eckhart Tolle, uh, Course in Miracles, uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, Dr. David R. Hawkins, Stuart Wilde, Sharon Salzberg, uh, who's been on the show, Byron Katie, who's been on the show, Marianne Williamson, Ram Das, Alan Watts, uh, Pia Melody's work on codependency, David Icke on a very different worldview. Um, listening to forward thinking people over and over and over and over again, people that have discovered truths and are expounding on them and sharing them to me has been really impactful because it's, it's how I've really kind of shaped my, um, shaped my worldview and my spiritual perspective, you know, is taking all of the different truths and finding what fits for me and applying it to my life and just studying the great teachers over and over and over and over again and really quite literally brainwashing myself and getting rid of all of the old types of thoughts and behavior that ran my life for so many years and replacing it with positive truth, with ultimate truth. I would say my number one out of all of those teachers uh, that's really stood the test of time has been Dr. David R. Hawkins. I've mentioned him on the podcast many times. I was able to see him um, on a couple of occasions before he passed years ago. And I'm so grateful that I did. And I just, I have hours and hours and hours of his audio and video stuff and just an incredible teacher, very down to earth, very um, <laughs> brilliant and also simple at the same time. Just a deeply intellectual, deeply spiritual man, but also just a very simple way of stating uh, truth. And then uh, of course, learning Vedic meditation with my teacher, Jeff Kober, hugely inf influential doing neurofeedback to heal brain trauma and I guess what you call kind of emotional PTSD. Very profound, very supportive of the whole journey. And then lastly, uh, to wrap up Lisa's question, would be really um, directly mentoring, uh, sponsoring, being of service to others, you know, helping to pass along, not just on the podcast and in a public forum, manner, but really on a one-on-one -on -one basis of really, you know, having a number of different guys that I've worked with over the years, many of whom I've been with for years, where I'm able to help uh, guide them through challenging situations or periods in their lives uh, based on the fact that I've been able to survive and in some cases even thrive through those same experiences. So, you know, it's, it's one thing to be saved and uh, to heal, but it's an entirely Another thing to not selfishly just kind of take your riches and run, so to speak, but to really stay in uh, in the ring, you know, and keep fighting for others. And I'm not saying that to try to sound like, you know, a great guy or that I'm this altruistic angel. I mean, I'm still quite selfish a lot of the time, but I really see the value in helping others and being of service in a profound way. And just, I think years ago, I made a decision. I just say yes. You know what I mean? It's like, if anyone needs anything, any of my, you know, my close knit um, inner circle, I'm just there. I'm a yes. I'm a yes. And I, I want to be known as the guy who's a yes, the guy that picks up the phone, the guy that will come over, the guy that comes to the hospital, the guy that's there. And that's just the type of um, friend and, you know, mentor, coach that I uh, aspire to be. And I'm sure I do it imperfectly, but. I have to say when it comes to what's really enriched and influenced my life, that um, finding the value and service has been extremely powerful and something that never ceases to amaze me. Just the rich experience I get to have in this, uh, in this lifetime by taking what I've learned and really having the passion, dedication, and discipline to pass it on to others. But, um, you know, just to ones that want to learn. I'm, I'm not for proselytizing and trying to get people to live the way I want to live. I'm just like, hey, I found some stuff that works. I've healed uh, from a lot of my suffering. And if you're interested, and this goes for you listeners, if you're interested in learning some of the things that I've discovered, I'll be your guide, you know, not your guru, not your hero, but I'll be your guide. And uh, I'm sure along the way, you'll find some things that you can share with me, which is most certainly true in the case of the Facebook group. You know, when people ask questions in there, Sometimes I don't know the answer and there's, you know, so many other members of the group have amazing information and great answers. Just people are so knowledgeable. It's really, really inspiring. So 
Um, I think in closing, I'd like to just say that I'm so happy to be a student of the audience and in some cases a teacher of the audience and a, and a student of my um, my guest, you know, my illustrious guest here on the show. And um, I really look forward to dropping some more of these solo Q&A podcast. Uh, it's something that's been asked of me for a couple of years and just took me forever to get around to it. So I banged out the first one here. I'm at 49 minutes, just one take straight through. Uh, I thought it would be about 30 minutes, but I guess I like to talk a little more than I realized. So thank you so much for joining me. And uh, until we meet again, God bless. This episode of the Lifestylist Podcast was produced by podcastmasters.net.